This episode is brought to you by Cora Tampons. Made from 100% certified organic cotton, every Cora product is made with pure and ethically sourced ingredients. No pesticides, no fragrances, no bleach, no BPA, no synthetic materials. If you're still using conventional tampons, we need to talk. <laughs> you don't even know what you're putting in your vagina. Head over to cora.life slash fertility Friday today and you'll get your first month's supply free of charge. This is the Fertility Friday podcast, episode number 136. Welcome to the 136th episode of the Fertility Friday podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com, and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I'm excited to share today's show with you. Today, I interview Dr. Kyle Beider, MD. He's actually a surgeon. He's an obstetrician gynecologist, and he took a specialized training in the NAPRO technology surgical protocols. And so in today's episode, we actually talk about the surgical side of things, which is something that I haven't spoken about too much on the show, and the approach that he takes uh, in his work, which is to preserve the natural function of your tissues to the best of his ability with the surgical practices that he's learned and uh, how that can be applied to endometriosis, PCOS, fibroids, and other cases. So it's a really, really interesting interview coming from a different perspective. If you're curious to know what's happening behind the scenes at Fertility Friday <laughs> Enterprises, I wanted to share with you that the newest group programs are fully underway. We've met already uh, two weeks in a row, and so far the groups have been going just incredible. I always say that I attract the most wonderful, sweet women to me, and it's been so much fun being able to connect with members of the community and really help them to deepen their knowledge of fertility awareness and help them to build that confidence in charting. So it's been a, a lot of fun. And if you have been charting yourself and you found that, you know, just feeling like you need that a little bit additional support if you're not really feeling like you're at the place that you can use the method super confidently for birth control, or even if you're having a hard time trying to figure out the best way to time if you're trying to conceive, I would definitely encourage you to check out my program. So head over to fertilityfriday.com slash work with me. I have a number of different ways to work with me and you can actually set up a free 15 minute consultation. If you have questions about the programs that I offer and you want to know if it's a good fit. And before we jump into today's episode, I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank our sponsor. All right, ladies, as my longtime listeners will know, it's been a really long time since I've had to walk down that dreaded feminine hygiene aisle <laughs> and look for menstrual products. Part of the reason that I find going down that menstrual cycle aisle to be so obnoxious is because it's always coated in layers of blue and pink and yellow. And maybe this is just going back to my experience as, as a young lady, but I never really felt the need to advertise to the world that I was having my period and having to pick up packages that are so obviously obnoxiously <laughs> menstrual products. I always found it to be just, it was almost like punishment. And so what I really appreciate about Cora, I mean, in addition to the fact that all of their products are made with 100% organic cotton, so no synthetic materials, no pesticides, no toxins. So other than that is the care that they've put into designing products that adult women would actually want to use. Products that don't act as an eyesore in your life that fit seamlessly into whether it's your bathroom or your purse. And so what's really neat is that when you sign up for a subscription with Cora, they send you their little black box and a little black clutch. And so the little black clutch is made of vegan leather. And so you can, you know, if you're inadvertently looking for something in your purse and you put your little tampon case on the table, whether you're in a boardroom or whether you're at a restaurant or something like that, you could put that thing beside your cell phone and no one will really notice it or pay attention to it you might get compliments on that like oh what's that cute case you have for me i don't feel the need to hide that i'm having my period i've had my period for 20 years and so i'm over it like i'm really not ashamed of it but even though i'm totally cool with my period it doesn't mean i want to pull out a pink box and announce it to the world at every turn and in every social situation so one of the things i really love about cora is how they have your back in terms of the design and 
one of the the tenets of you know behind the the whole business model is to improve your experience of having your menstrual products so if you've never heard of Cora, if you haven't checked out their products i would suggest for you to head over to cora.life slash fertility friday and make sure to check out the product design you'll be pleasantly surprised to find that here is a product that was designed by women for women with women in mind so definitely head over to cora.life slash fertility friday and when you sign up you actually will receive your first month's supply free of charge so now let's head back to the show And today I'm very excited to welcome my guest, Dr. Kyle Beider to the show. Dr. Beider is a board certified medical doctor with a specialization in the field of obstetrics and gynecology, who specializes in fertility. Dr. Beider is a trained NAPRO technology surgeon. And for those of you who aren't familiar with NAPRO technology, it is a specialized form of gynecological surgery whose primary aim is to reconstruct the uterus, fallopian tubes, and ovaries in such a way that minimizes adhesions, basically protecting your tissues instead of destroying your tissues. And so in today's episode, we'll be talking about the surgical side of NAPRO technology and what it can really mean for your health and your fertility. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Dr. Bider. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Thank you so much for being here. I'd love to start just by getting a sense from you of what inspired you to take this route and to take the extra training, I I'm, I'm, can't imagine how, you know, in addition to being a surgeon, going ahead and taking the extra training in the specialized field. Yes. Well, yeah. Well, thanks for asking. It is a long road, obviously. Uh, I mean, uh, you have college and then medical school and OBGYN residency, and that right there is 12 years. And so, <laughs> yeah, I did the additional fellowship. I guess uh, I-, I love surgery. Um, I thought about going to general surgery, but, you know, in general surgery, Gosh, it's like you're taking out organs and then you never see patients again, and that's okay. We need good surgeons, obviously, but I felt like that kind of wasn't for me and kind of depressing sometimes, obviously. But with gynecologic surgery, you know, usually patients are a little bit younger and healthier, especially if they're fertility patients. So it's really rewarding, I, I felt like, to have a relationship with your patients where you help them with their fertility and then also maybe care, care for them through their pregnancies and um, then see them for their yearly exams, for example. I felt that was a lot more rewarding for me. That's one reason. The other reason is I'm very pro-life, obviously. And as you may know, that the fertility care system, NAPRA technology, based on Catholic ethics, but meant for anyone, certainly, but but based on Catholic ethics. And so I I feel like, obviously, there's a lot of other doctors out there that are the opposite of pro-life, obviously. All right, so we have no shortage of them, but I feel like there's not that many that are really pro-life, unfortunately. So I felt like, gosh, I I want women to have that option, obviously. And since I feel strongly, so here I am. So... So uh, that was the second big reason that I uh, did go into this area. Well, I'd like to hear a little more about that. I think when you say pro-life, it conjures up a lot of infor- you know, ideas for people, but specifically with respect to the surgical techniques and how it comes from a basis of protecting and supporting the tissues, I'd love for you to just talk a little bit about how that philosophy of medical care in particular differs from the mainstream traditional medical care. Well, sure. For, for example, mainstream medical care, if you have pelvic pain or, or even endometriosis, for example, on an ultrasound, oftentimes the first knee-jerk response is to put someone on suppressive hormones, um, birth control pills or depo-prepare shots or Lupron injections, for example. Um, and it's true that studies suggest that for some women, those therapies can help, but, but what's the cost? Gosh, those things do have a lot of potential side effects. Uh, certainly infertility being an obvious one, you cannot conceive on any of those that I mentioned. Uh, but not only that, gosh, you know, small risks of, of blood clots and liver tumors or lack of sexual desire or, I mean, one thought is, gosh, do you want to have a, a steak with some artificial hormones? I think people would probably say, no, not really. Well, then would you like to take a pill with 5,000 times the amount of artificial hormones? Oh, my gosh, on a daily basis? Oh, yeah, so it's not, you know, you know, it's not that appealing, obviously. And and not to say Lupron, one of the things, too, I, I've, uh, you know, I, I understand there's some con- concern about that with possible autoimmune issues if you take Lupron for a long time. So, you know, certainly not the best medication, even if you, whatever ethical kind of bent you are, not the best medication. And it, it's true that, I mean, one bias, too, I have is, gosh, this maybe is a, a little bit peripheral, but in the area of family planning, okay, well, why don't men take hormones? I mean, come on here. What, women must take the hormones? So, I mean, I don't know how much of this that comes from that, but it, it seemed a little bit one-sided to me. I mean, 
in the area of family planning, certainly it should be something that both partners do. I mean, I think that's the obvious ideal, isn't it? And so I don't know how much of that is kind of an overlap with the, the using hormones so much for, for pelvic pain and fertility and so forth. And, and certainly in terms of surgery, those kind of motivations, I guess maybe you might say the same motivations of wanting to get to the, the underlying problems and, and to do a good job. In the back of my mind, when I'm operating, I'm not thinking, well, I'm just going to send this patient for IVF, so I, if I swap things up a little bit, it's okay. You know, I, I, obviously, that's not a good attitude for any surgeon to have, you know, whether, no matter how you feel about IVF. So, um, but the attitude I have is, darn it, I'm going to attack this and really try to, my goal is to get it all out, you know, as much as I can. I'll admit I can't always do that because it can be on some difficult places sometimes, but that's certainly the goal. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I, I love your analogy of the steak. I think I might, I might borrow that <laughs> in the future. Because I think it's, it, it puts it into perspective. Would you eat a steak if it was injected with, you know, a ton of estro- estrogen-like hormones and progesterone-like hormones? Uh, probably not. So I really like that. And just the approach of really getting to the underlying cause of, of everything. And so to start our discussion, you were already a surgeon. So you were already trained in surgical techniques. So I, I suppose one of the obvious questions is how much more is there to learn uh, how did learning this additional aspect of things change your practice or change your understanding of even of the, of the way the body works? So, you know, it's true. Uh, maybe the, the broad picture of this is that in, in surgical training, you know, I, I, well, specifically in gynecology, I can't speak for like general surgeons and other areas of surgery, but in obstetric and gynecology, unfortunately, training hours are becoming shorter. And what I mean by that is work, at least in the United States, work hour restrictions. Part of that is a good thing. Gosh, it's good to get some sleep when you're in your training instead of being up for like three days at a time. Okay, so that's good. But they may, the pendulum may have swung too much where now, you know, a lot of graduating OBGYNs from their residency programs don't have the surgical numbers that, that people had 20 or, or 30 years ago. And so there, there's just, there's a lot to learn and they're learning, there's more and more to learn and, and they're learning less of it in terms of surgical techniques. Um, so that's that's one aspect. I can just tell you that, you know, a lot of the things I do based on my fellowship and my experience since then, a lot of residents coming out of training would not attempt that just because they don't have the experience of doing it. If they don't do a fellowship and have no one to show them, then, you know, it's going to be really kind of a long shot for them to just to pick up a book and, and try to learn on their own and do it. So I guess that's that's maybe the biggest thing. It's just, uh, you know, exposure to a very specialized area of surgery that I would not have had and otherwise probably would not have attempted on my own. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense, having that mentorship and that guidance in those areas. And so let's talk a little bit about why a woman might need surgery. It might be obvious to some of the listeners, uh, maybe not so much to others, but what are the reasons why patients come to you for surgery in the first place? Yeah, so I guess two main reasons. One is, is pelvic pain and the other is fertility. So both of those, and they can overlap or you can have them both simultaneously, obviously. And a lot of times it may be a patient who has had pain or fertility issues for a long time, and they may have gone to other physicians, other gynecologists or, or, or other physicians who, you know, tried to treat them the best they could with either suppressive hormones or IVF or insemination or whatever else they were trying, and those patients have not had success. So that's maybe the biggest reason why they come to me. Well, why don't we t- uh, break it down a little bit? So, I mean... From your perspective, now having the, the, the training that you have, uh, for a woman, let's uh, we can go through a few different conditions, but maybe we could start by talking a little bit about fibroids. Uh, okay. Fibroids is something I've experienced personally. I didn't need surgery. Um, they just didn't grow that big. But I know it, it pro- predominantly there's a large percentage of uh, you know black women who are affected by it. They theorize that potentially genetics, but obviously it's an is- issue for many women. But Maybe you could talk a little bit about fibroids and, you know, when is surgery something that might be an option and and then perhaps why in other situations it's not something that would be recommended. So, right. So fibroids, as you mentioned, are very, very common and um, up to about maybe 80% of women have them if they live to be, you know, uh, uh, you know, live a long life. But it's true that not all fibroids may cause problems. For example, if you have one small little sub-centimeter fibroid buried in the muscle of your uterus, okay, there's a great chance that that may be asymptomatic. And because they're so common, if you start doing ultrasounds for someone for whatever reason, for infertility or pelvic pain, you may see a fibroid. And so then the question is, gosh, well, you know, is that fibroid responsible for this pain or this bleeding or this fertility? So 
certainly may, may be a little bit difficult to study from the standpoint that they're very heterogeneous. They could be different sizes. They can be in different locations of the uterus. So that you know makes it a little bit more difficult to study. But there are now a number of studies and maybe a, a loose consensus on when a surgery may be a good idea for patients with fibroids. So a couple things about that. One is likely the larger a fibroid gets, the more it may cause problems. For fertility specifically, there's some consensus that a fibroid five centimeters or larger may cause some problems with fertility. Now I say may, it doesn't mean guarantee. Everyone's different. If I saw a very young 21-year-old with a five centimeter fibroid and she had no pain and she'd never tried to get pregnant and no problems, I'd probably say, okay, well, you had this fibroid. Um, you're very young and otherwise healthy. You've never even tried to get pregnant. You have no pain. I probably would just watch it for now. Um, there's a good chance maybe it may not grow. It may grow, but it's something we can keep an eye on. And then if five years later she gets pregnant and does fine, hey, that's, you know, obviously she's happy and I'm happy. However, let's say we have like a 35-year-old and she'd been trying to get pregnant for five years and she even tries some medications to get pregnant and she has this five same. Okay, that would be a patient I'd be much more likely to say, well, I mean, we you've tried to get pregnant. You're, maybe your husband's uh, sperm counts are fine. Your fallopian tubes are open. Your hormones look pretty good. It seems like this fibroid may be uh, one of the things preventing your, uh, your pregnancy. So in that circumstance, I would, offer, I would likely offer a patient like that a surgery to remove the fibroid if it's five centimeters or larger, and or the location. So it, the closer that fibroid is to the uterine cavity, the more likely it is to cause problems. Um, if it's growing into the inside of the uterine cavity, then there's a chance it really may be causing problems. When they look at studies and they take groups of women who've had fibroid surgery and look, okay, and, and look back and see what happens to them, it's, um, the evidence is pretty strong that if you take fibroids out of the uterine cavity, that that can decrease the chance of miscarriage and, and increase fertility. And sometimes if it is growing into the cavity and it's not too large, I mean, it, those fibroids it could be small. Maybe it's just a one centimeter fibroid. Sometimes you can get that with a, a much smaller procedure just through the woman's cervix instead of having to make incisions on the abdomen. You know, that, that can be good, especially for that type of fibroid. In my own practice for a larger fibroid, like if it's like five centimeters or larger, usually I had to do that by a laparoscopy and then uh, make incisions to take the fibroid out. Um, okay, and for a non-doctor like myself, what is a laparoscopy? So laparoscopy is a mode of surgery, I guess. It's a, a style of surgery where you only use very small incisions, typically through the belly button and maybe a couple of other incisions on the abdomen that are about a centimeter or half a centimeter. Uh, and that's in, um, in contrast to a traditional surgery, which is an open surgery, maybe a very large incision, I don't know, maybe 10 or 12 centimeters uh, at the bottom of the abdomen. Okay, so... In the procedures that you're describing, you're removing a larger size uh, fibroid, but you're not opening up the whole uterus, so really minimizing potential scar tissue and those types of things. Yes. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. What are the risks involved? You mentioned some research that shows that when a woman is potentially having difficulties conceiving, it's possible that if the fibroid is, is large and if it's removed, that could reduce the risk of her having miscarriage, those types of things. So what are the risks involved in surgery? And then I guess the, the benefits as well in those cases. So, I mean, for, for fibroids, uh, well, for any patient thinking about having a surgery, I always talk about the risk of bleeding, infection, and injury. Um, so certainly that's got to be a risk with any surgery you have. For fibroids uh, specifically, uh, they can be very bloody surgeries because the uterus is pretty vascularized. And the larger the fibroid gets, then the larger the incision you'll need to make on the uterus to remove it. General principles are the larger a fibroid gets, then the more blood loss you can uh, anticipate could be possible. And also that increases the chance the patient may need a blood transfusion. Uh, so, for example, in my practice for a fibroid, maybe for a 10-centimeter fibroid, uh, I would tell patients, okay, maybe a 30% chance of transfusion, for example, and also recovery. Gosh, the larger the fibroid gets, then, you know, just the surgery can take a little longer. Your recovery might be a little longer. I might tell patients like that that their recovery might be a month long uh, after a, a removing a 10 centimeter fibroid, whereas the fibroid was uh, four or five centimeters, okay, maybe a two or three weeks recovery, for example. You know, in terms of the injury for fibroid surgery, you know, certainly, well, the main thing is the uterus. I mean, oftentimes, fibroids are not scarred to the rectum, for example, or to the pelvic sidewall where you would worry about injuring other organs. Um, I mean, there's always a small chance of that, but usually fibroids are, uh, you know, the, the top of the uterus where, you, you know, there'd be very small chance you would cut into another structure. 
but certainly could the uterus be warped? As I mentioned, fibroids obviously could be at any part of the uterus. Could it be near the uterine blood vessels or could it be near the fallopian tubes where if you take the fibroid out and then sew it closed, might you have some kinking uh, of the fallopian tube, for example? Might you block that? Yes, I mean, all that's possible. So that's why it's often, I, I feel, a good idea to have a pelvic MRI prior to a myomectomy an ultrasound is usually the first imaging test done, and that's very quick and, and relatively uh, inexpensive and a good first-line test to see fibroids. But if you're thinking about surgery especially, MRI is a little bit better at localizing that fibroid within the uterus and showing where it is in relation to maybe the fallopian tubes, if, if you can see them, for example, or, uh, or other parts of the uterus. For, again, for most patients, consider an MRI to really, to really see where it is. And then I would talk with them and say, hey, okay, your fibroid is right in the middle of the uterus between your tubes. I think there's a great chance I would not have to, your fallopian tubes would not be kinked uh, when I take that out, for example. It's true also we worry about scar tissue, not only outside the uterus, but inside the uterus, um, especially if the fibroid is a really big fibroid that is pressing into your uterine cavity. When we take that out, we'll close the incision, but you know there could be some scar tissue inside or outside the uterus. So certainly a very good closure of that muscle is necessary. And in general, when you talk about surgery, the main surgical skill is dissection. Can you dissect out structures and make sure to get out the bad structures, get out endometriosis, for example, and make sure the ureter is safe or blood vessels are safe? But for fibroids, you do have to dissect a little bit, but maybe one of the major skills for fibroid surgery is um, your ability to close the uterine muscle nicely with stitches and make sure it's really secure afterwards. So, uh, you know, maybe a little bit different uh, surgical skills are necessary to do that. And laparoscopically, you know, that, that's very nice for patients because the incisions are small and the recovery time is, is shorter compared with the big open surgery. But it's true that it is, much, it is more difficult to, to stitch laparoscopically. And so it's taken me a while to become adept at that. But because I, you're stitching I blind, right? Like you're well, it, in yeah, not it's lines. Not blind, but. Right. You can see it, but it's like you have just little, your little instruments. You don't have your hands. You can move how you want, obviously. But you know, you have limited degree of motion, and it depends on where your ports are, too. You're kind of restricted by where you, you place your ports. If you just keep putting in more ports everywhere, you're going to have, like, a pin cushion, right? So you can't really do that to a patient. I mean, you know, if it's an open surgery, again, you can reach your hands in from almost any angle and stitch how you want to. But laparoscopically, you're, you're limited by where your ports are. So that is going to affect, uh, you know, that makes it more difficult. And again, you can do this, and lots of very good you know, physicians have uh, done this over the years, and and uh, have different techniques of laparoscopic suturing, which I've kind of adopted and, and use now. It's true that I don't know if this is too tangential. You've likely heard of the Da Vinci robot. I've heard of it, or yeah. Maybe. You heard it, yeah. So it's basically a robot that allows you to do laparoscopy. And it's a really a neat device. Um, it uh, it kind of, if you look at it, it, looks like a big kind of electronic spider that hooks up to the laparoscopic instruments. And when those hands go inside, unlike your, your normal laparoscopic instruments that just, you know, you, you kind of have to, your range of, of motion is a little restricted. But with a robot, you can articulate inside. So it is almost like you have your hands inside. So that is a very nice tool. And I have used it before, but I, I don't use it anymore because I feel like I can do the same thing uh, with just normal laparoscopy. And I don't want to get too detailed on all the reasons why. It's true that large studies don't suggest a difference in terms of uh, patient recovery or blood loss or uh, patient out fertility outcomes. Or So large studies suggest there's no difference between the robot and normal laparoscopy. It's true that the, lo that the, that the robot, uh, you need more incisions usually for the case, and it can be a little bit larger, whereas I use maybe a little bit less incisions, a little bit smaller. The robot's much more expensive. Now, that expense mostly falls on the hospitals. Insurance companies, for example, do, here in America, do not pay a surgeon anymore or the hospital anymore for them using the, the robot. But I will say that if a physician, if you cannot suture laparoscopically well, then the robot can help you do that. So I'm not saying it's all bad. I mean, I, I you know, have certain reasons I choose not to use it, but it can be very good. I know Dr. Hilgers, who... Uh, pioneered uh, NAPRA technology, he really does like the robot, and he's very good at it. He, the way he does it, he does it very nicely, the way he, uh, he sews. And it's true, you can be very delicate with the robot. I'll say one area that I think the robot would be really great in would be tubal anastomosis, where you have someone maybe has had a sterilization before, and you, you want to put the tubes back together. Okay, so for that, I learned to do that by microsurgery, by having a really big magnification and, and sewing open surgery. 
but the robot does have some advantages. It avoids tremor because your hands might be have a you know a little tremor when you're in the robot, but it can filter that out and make it make you not have a tremor. So if I had a lot of tubal reversal surgeries, I would probably love the robot for that. Unfortunately, here in New Jersey, insurance doesn't pay for that, and so I have very few, if any, I offer all the time to patients to reverse their serializations, but many patients cannot go through with that. So I don't have enough of a volume. That alone doesn't give me enough of volume to justify to keep using the robot. So I don't use it anymore. I, I can do tubal reversal just with normal laparoscopies. Probably takes me a little bit longer than someone would who's really good at it with a robot, but yeah, that's about it. I don't want to go. I don't want to well, yeah, get no. off into many tangents. <laughs> but no, thank you. That's really that's really interesting. And one of the questions that came to mind is: so for a woman who has fibroids and she's thinking about how to how to manage that, you know, in her case, she's considering surgery. From your experience now, what is the main difference between a surgeon then who has been trained the way you have been it, on the NAPRO technology surgical side versus a uh, a surgeon who has not been trained in this in this way. I mean, for many types of surgery, I guess the main difference might be an adhesion and adhesion prevention uh, strategies. So, I'm for sorry, example, what we, exactly is an adhesion for all the listeners? So, adhesion is is, uh, is abnormal scar tissue that can develop after surgery, and it's when you have two surfaces that should not be stuck together then become stuck stuck together. So, certainly, surgery can cause that. Other things can cause it too. Endometriosis can cause it, or a prior pelvic infection can cause it, for example. Uh, but surgery can cause it, and so you know you'd like to uh, minimize. You know, Dr. Hildreth did a great job at when he trained us, and he did a lot of research himself um, with his own patients about how to minimize that. And, and one of the things that he stressed to us was the way you close tissues to try to reapproximate them really neatly, as neatly as you can, to minimize the chance of adhesions. You know, as gentle handling of the tissues uh, as you can. Trying not to make as many peritoneal incisions if you can help it. Now, certainly, and that means incisions and, and, and the tissues around the uterus uh, through the tissue there. And fibroid surgery, certainly that's, uh, you know, there's a good chance you don't need to do that. Other types of surgery like endometriosis, sometimes you're kind of forced to do that because the endometriosis might be involving that tissue. So then there's other techniques that he taught us, including sometimes using adhesion barriers, so either dissolvable or non-dissolvable uh, structures that will prevent scarring, leaving extra fluid in the abdomen so that the tissues float on each other as they heal, and then that will eventually dissolve and, and there's less chance of, uh, of scarring. Sometimes using temporary suspension sutures, for example, if there's a lot of irritation after surgery under the ovaries, then placing a temporary stitch on the ovary to lift it out of the pelvis so that as it heals, the area underneath will heal, and then later that tissue will, the ovary and the tube will drop back uh, and less of a chance they'll scar down after that. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some of the set techniques that he taught us. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit about endometriosis. Uh, it's interesting reading Thomas uh, Hilger's, Dr. Hilger's work around endometriosis. From what I gather, it, it sounds as though it's, it's a much bigger problem than we think about because, of course, diagnosing it is not necessarily easy. So maybe we could start there. You could share, maybe you could share a little bit about what endometriosis is and then how one would go about making a diagnosis. So endometriosis, uh, you know, an easy way to define it would be the presence of endometrial, so the endometrium. The endometrium is the normal tissue inside the uterus. That's the layer every month that sheds with menstruation. And that tissue, the endometrial tissue, lines the inside of the uterus. That's where an embryo implants when a woman is pregnant. So it's normal for that tissue to be inside the uterus. However, endometriosis is when the endometrium exists in an abnormal location. For example, on the ovaries or uh, on the intestines or on the fallopian tubes. It's not supposed to be there. And so in those places, it's called endometriosis. It's not cancer. Uh, it's benign, but, it is, uh, but it's a disease that can be associated with pelvic pain and infertility or both. So a couple of thoughts about this at the outset. I'm pretty, prag how do you say, maybe practical or pragmatic. If a patient has endometriosis, and let, let's say my imaging test says they have endometriosis, but they don't have any symptoms, they have no pelvic pain, they have five children, and they have no problems getting, then I would say, okay, what can my surgery do for you? Uh, my surgery is going to give you temporary pain, okay, uh, and some temporary risk, but you have no pain, okay, so I can't improve that. You have no problems getting pregnant, I can't improve that. So that's why... You know, I wouldn't recommend surgery for all patients with endometriosis, but only someone that had 
with fertility problems or pelvic pain or a mix of both those things, then surgery is a consideration. And it's a really strange disease. Some patients, like I mentioned, some patients have no pain, no fertility problems with it. Some patients have one but not the other, uh, vice versa. So it's a really strange disease, and I think you have to certainly customize it, kind of like fibroids. Um, you have to customize whether surgery may be right for a, a certain patient. So if someone comes to me, how do we know if they have endometriosis? Well, first, you would start with a, a physical exam and a good history of what their symptoms are and, and what they experience. And also, typically, I'd start with an ultrasound as the first-line imaging test because it's relatively inexpensive, and you can see a lot on You can't see everything, but you can see a lot with ultrasound. So with those things, those would be the initial things. Now, it's true that even if their physical exam is completely normal, and even if their ultrasound is completely normal, that still does not rule out endometriosis entirely. Now, it, it may be true that if they have high-stage disease, okay, many times in, uh, an ultrasound or physical exam would bring that up. For example... If an ultrasound saw a big cyst of endometriosis on the ovaries, or if on my physical exam I felt some tender nodularity behind their uterus, okay, that would tell me they could have a, a high stage of disease. But again, if their ultrasound is completely normal, physical exam normal, they still could have disease just out of the reach of my hand, for example, or maybe it's thinly layering the tissue so the ultrasound can't see it. So that's why it's true that if a patient does have significant fertility problems or, or pain, then laparoscopy is the only 100% way to rule it out, to know if they have it, and also to treat it at the same time we can cut it out. I will say that for some patients, MRI is a different test, imaging test we can use uh, for endometriosis. Uh, MRI is better at seeing uh, intestinal nodules of endometriosis, for example. So if I had a patient where I thought, oh, I, you know, I'm not sure ultrasound can't see her bowels that well, she has a lot of pain and bleeding with her bowel movements. So, oh my gosh. So then I would probably get an MRI. And, an MRI can see large nodules on the bowels, but it's true. For, for a small disease, even if the MRI was normal, they still could have some endometriosis, uh, you know, a milder form of the disease. Well, that's really interesting um, and unfortunate that it sounds as though you could have endometriosis, but really to get kind of that 100%, like you said, diagnosis, you would need to have somebody go into your body with an instrument. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. Yep. Um, so one of the questions that came to mind as you were talking about endometriosis is how can endometriosis negatively impact fertility? So in the cases where it's actually a contributing factor or the cause for infertility, what is it doing to disrupt the natural flow of things? So great question. And I don't mean to be flippant and laughing, but it's, it's something that probably physicians will argue for a long time because there's a lot of you know, contradictory studies and back and forth. So a couple things about it. Obviously, if it's a high-grade disease where it, it is scarring the tubes or ovaries and restricting the fallopian tube from picking up an egg from the ovary, then that's an obvious way it can uh, interfere with fertility. So, th so that's maybe, maybe the, the biggest way it, it impacts on fertility. And sorry, can I just ask in there, does that mean that the endometrial tissue is potentially growing kind of on or around the fallopian tube itself and kind of warping the fallopian tubes just is, is that, I'm trying to get a visual kind of sure. image. Yeah, it can be, yes. Or another example is perhaps it, it's, it has a big cyst on the ovary. And then, so that maybe, for example, there's a 10 centimeter cyst on the ovary, which has really grown and kind of pushed the fallopian tube up out of the pelvis. So it can't come down and pick up an egg. Um, or maybe, you're right, maybe there, there's scar tissues between the ovary and the back of the uterus and the fallopian tube is caught in that. And it can't, you know, it's restricted in its ability to, to pick up a, for, uh, an egg, so to speak. So, yeah, you could conceptualize like that. Yes, there could be endometriosis and tissues around the tube or even on the surface of the tube itself, kind of kinking the tube and, and drawing it back or even scarring the end of the tube closed and causing a tubal obstruction. So, yes, it can do all of that. Hmm. Well, thank you for the and, visual. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I don't know. Sorry. That's, uh, <laughs> all right. So, so the, the, the more kind of significant manifestations, it's pretty obvious how it can negatively impact fertility. The more milder forms of disease it's maybe a little bit more subtle, if you will. So definitely endometriosis seems like it's associated with fertility, but exactly how it causes in the milder forms of disease is controversial. I'll admit that, certainly. There's several different uh, theories about this. One is that, you know, even if these implants of endometriosis are not on the tubes and ovaries, we know they can secrete uh, cytokines and other inflammatory molecules that, for example, if you take these endometriosis fluid, so to speak, and try to grow an embryo in that, that embryo will die quickly, for example. Okay, so that's circumstantial kind of suggestive evidence that maybe this is bad for fertility. 
there's other studies suggesting that the cavity, the endometrial cavity of patients with endometriosis is different. It has different expression of immune molecules that might affect their ability to implant an embryo. So those are some of the kind of the path that the research in this can take in terms of uh, observational studies about how surgery, can surgery help? So, and, and this will go back and forth, the largest study of its kind said yes. And it was a study of over 300 patients. It was done in Canada, actually, back in 19, I believe, 1997, so about 20 years ago now. And this study was only on, uh, well, all these, all 300 patients had uh, mild endometriosis, stage one or stage two, minimal or mild. And they, half the patients, they just looked at the endometriosis with, uh, during the surgery, but didn't touch it, did not vaporize it, did not uh, excise it out. The other half, they did either cauterize it or cut out the disease. Over the course of that study, uh, then, they, then they followed patients afterwards for about nine months. The patients that they did remove the endometriosis, I believe about 32% of those patients had a conception. The patients that they just looked at the disease, about 18% of those patients had a conception. So it was almost, it didn't double their fertility, but it almost did over the course of that study. And that was the largest study of its kind. A smaller study uh, done, and I think it was done in Europe, did not show that difference. Now, you would think a larger study has more power, so I would tend to, to trust the, the results of a larger study. But that's why I taught, and, and also, one other thought, not to confuse things, but certainly fertility, there are many different factors. Not just endometriosis, but your husband's sperm count, uh, your fallopian tubes, um, your hormones. I mean, there's a lot of different aspects of this. So that's why it makes sense that maybe some of those endometriosis patients got pregnant. Okay, maybe they had better uh, progesterone after their ovulations, for example, or maybe their husband's sperm counts were better. I mean, so, you know, it's a mix of things. So that's why I always customize. I talk to the patient, I say, gosh, how old is the patient? Certainly your age is going to affect, you know, your, your fertility potential. But I always customize it and, and try to be transparent with them. I, I tell them, look, endometriosis is not 100% blocked, but it can be additive in addition to everything else you might have going for you or against you. And so that's why I talk about the overall context of their health and, um, and how to figure out surgery, if surgery is right for them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really interesting because it sounds as though there's a lot of different factors that play like anything in life. And so you have the very physical kind of obvious obstructions that can be caused and adhesions and the different ways that it could prevent the actual just function, just the function of ovulation, right. the, the fallopian tubes picking up the egg, that type of thing. But then you also have this more of an underlying issue that could, it sounds like it could have something to do with autoimmunity or uh, changing the, the, the way that the uterine lining functions so that it's not as receptive to fertilized eggs. So it sounds as though there's a lot of things going on. And so I would imagine just as you're elaborating there that there are situations in which it would appear that surgery is a really good option for a patient and others where it's more unclear as to whether or not it would actually do anything for them. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, along the same line, so this question c relates a bit to endometriosis and fibroids, but in the patients that you have, when you do remove said tissue, actually, I have a kind of like a selfish, curious question. And well, I wouldn't say selfish, but definitely sure. just straight up curiosity. But I mean, you're in there doing surgery and actually looking at the insides. I've never seen anyone's insides. I'm not a surgeon. What does endometriosis look like? <laughs> uh, well, I'm well. Good question. Do I can show. Do you want me to show you pictures? I don't know if it's appropriate place to show you pictures. I could try, but well, you I could, could just, I, actually. And then could, you, yeah, if you the, have the webcam, just turn around. Yeah, yeah. And then so, you have right. a, a picture. If you could send it to me, we could actually put sure. it on the the show notes page after for oh, the listeners. Sure, yeah. These are some pictures from some of my own patients, and I often use these to illustrate these issues before we do surgery. So, okay, here is a picture of a normal uterus and fallopian tubes. And there's no uh, endometriosis there. I know this resolution isn't that great, but let me flip through. Endometriosis can look like many different things. It can look like little kind of these black powders burn spots here. Mm -hmm. It can look like little blisters. If someone's had surgery before where they've just had it cauterized, it can look like little um, implants under the, the tissue there. Now, severe disease can start uh, scarring to the back. Here's the... It's scarred to the bowels. Here's the intestines right here, and it's kind of scarring there. And also here beside, behind the uterocycle ligaments, that's more severe disease. And, the, and here is someone's appendix all really scarred up inside. And you can see those little kind of blisters and vesicles around there. Mm -hmm. And so we need one more picture here of severe. Here's an ovarian cyst of endometriosis. That's white because the ovary is white, but inside there's an endometriosis cyst. Is that why it looks so and, big? 
That's why it's enlarged compared to the other normal ovary is, is smaller mm-hmm. uh, there. So for the listeners, it looks like it's like three times the size. Is yeah. That about right? That, right. So that's just what's big, right. Yeah. And then finally, I'll show you a picture of, in this picture, this is a very severe case. And this, um, here you can see the top of the uterus here. You can just barely see the edge of the uterus. Underneath it, you have all the scar tissue and blood. And that's, that's before any surgeries even started. That's just how she was. You know, it's hard to tell, okay, where's the ovary? Where's the fallopian tube? I can't even tell right away where those structures are because it's just so really distorted and messed up. So this patient had pain and fertility issues. And thankfully afterwards, she was able to get pregnant and her pain did decrease. But I'll admit hers was a really tough case and I'll admit that I was not able to get it all out. And, and that's another thing I'll say is that, you know, certainly I take, every surgeon, we take pride in our work. We'd like to be the best. A- am I the best surgeon in the world? No, I'm not. If I knew who that was, I would tell you. I, I can tell you who more experienced surgeons are than me. But I, I think, you know, I've done a lot of work in this. and I feel like I'm, I'm very adept at endometriosis surgery. But the message I have here is the power of the human body. Now, certainly uh, when I say this, I don't mean to say that, oh, again, you should be a sloppy surgeon. No, you should be the best you can and do the best job for the patients. But despite that, the human body is much more wonderful than we even know. And so it's, it's amazing how some women with horrible endometriosis get pregnant without surgery. And that's really amazing. And some women, women when you go um, and you do their surgery, you're just appalled at, at how bad the, the disease is. And I, I know I go home sometimes at night and my wife is like, look, don't be depressed. You didn't cause this disease in them. I mean, you're not God, obviously. And all you can do is your best to, to take out all of it, all that you can. And you have to leave the rest up to God. And so many times, though, it's amazing how many of these women do conceive. And again, I, it's just... Um, so it's a, it's a mysterious thing, you know, that interplay between, you know, we do the best job we can for patients and then, you know, the rest is uh, it's kind of up to God, so to speak, and we see what happens with them. Mm-hmm. And certainly after, after surgery for endometriosis, you know, we, we go and we, you know, still work on their hormones, for example, or their husband's sperm count and so forth. Repeat surgery, sometimes I feel that's indicated. Uh, for example, uh, you know, if a patient had very bad disease and I'm worried that she might have more of a chance than usual forming scar tissue, then, you know, my first line thing to do, though, would be, to first think about if she does not conceive within, say, for example, six months or a year, think about doing a repeat ultrasound. And really, it's amazing with ultrasound what you can do now, really press on the ultrasound probe while you're doing the exam to see if her organs slide. If they slide, that means they're not scarred together. So for ovary, now normal tubes, normal floping tubes, you cannot see an ultrasound, but you can see the ovary and it's close by the tube. So you know, there's a reasonable chance that if their ovaries are sliding past adjacent structures, that, that perhaps they're, you know, her fallopian tubes are not scarred. You know, there's other tests you can do for fallopian tubes, such as hysterosalpingograms. You know, then you can see the tubes a little better. So, again, even after a surgery, that's why you, you customize it compared to how their surgery went and how bad their disease was and, and so forth. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for showing the images. So for the listeners, I'll have Dr. Bider send me some a few images and then I can put them up. So if they want to see uh, what struck me is because as a lay person, you just have no idea. So then when you're looking, it looked as though the healthy picture, the tissue was the color you would expect. You know, it looks healthy and vibrant and pink. <laughs> and then <laughs> in the, the, the tissue that's not so healthy, you see these little bumps and dark and darker color, the color strikes and then you strikes you. And then also the, the shape of the organs and things like that. So it's, it's that visual, quite literal of disease. Whereas uh, for us lay people, when we think of disease, it's more of a concept. So I really appreciate you making that a little bit more concrete for me, because I yep. think that's going to stay with me. And so the question that I had before I, you know, asked for the little show and tell was, you know, how often does this stuff come back? So you go in there, you cut it out. Does it come back? Great question. So a couple of answers to that. One is, so, so it's, <laughs> I wish I could give you a, sound, a, a quick uh, one sentence answer to that, but I can't. And I'll tell you why. So it is possible to cure a patient of endometriosis. Authors like David Redwine uh, and even Dr. Hilders and others have documented that, okay, we have this whole group of patients we did an endometriosis surgery on, and then for whatever reason, we did another surgery sometime in the future, and a, a good percent of patients, there's no more endometriosis. It's all gone. We can't find it anymore. So it's possible, it is possible to cure patients. However, I want to talk about distinction between recurrence and residual disease. So now I feel like residual disease is a lot more common than a true recurrence. Okay. For residual disease, uh, when I say that, I mean that they maybe had a prior surgery with a doctor, and that doctor was not able to get it all out, either due to where it was located or or his or her skill, 
um, but there's still some left. If you have another surgery, you're still going to fight, find it there. It's not like it, it suddenly came back. It just, it, it, it remained. Okay. So that's persistent disease or, um, uh, residual disease. I would say a true recurrence is where you have endometriosis and a new spot that you did not have it before. I feel that that is relatively uncommon except for two exceptions, uh, the ovaries and the uterine muscle. So the ovaries, they're, they're always um, becoming inflamed every month with ovulation. And one theory about how you can get ovarian endometriosis, so like a big cyst on your ovaries, is that you may have just a little small spot of endometriosis on the edge of your ovary or on the tissue around your ovary. And if you happen to ovulate right by that spot, that area can become bloody and irritated and then expand into a big cyst. So endometriomas uh, are noted to, to recur unfortunately, relatively frequently after surgery. I have had patients with recurrent endometriomas. I can't calculate an exact number. But it's true that when I read studies about this, my own experience echoes many of those things. For example, the younger a patient is when they might have surgery for endometriosis, they have an increased chance of having a recurrent endometrioma or a new endometriosis cyst. And the older a patient, that risk decreases. Why is that? Maybe because young patients are going to have more ovulations you know, until they reach menopause. That, that may be. The second area is the uterine muscle, and there's a special kind of endometriosis called adenomyosis, and that means endometriosis of the muscle inside the uterus. Now, remember, it's normal for the endometrium to be on the very inside the uterus, the uterine cavity. That's normal. That's not endometriosis. However, if that endometriosis is in the deep in the muscle of the uterus, okay, it's not normal for the endometrium to be there. That should just be myometrium or uterine muscle. It should not be endometrium. So, so adenomyosis is endometriosis buried deep in the muscle of the uterus. That is more common for women to get maybe in their late 30s or early 40s when women seem to develop that on average. Other types of endometriosis like on your intestines or on the outside of your uterus or the, the, the tissues under your ovaries, that seems like it may form in your late teens or early 20s. Um, so, so it's a little bit curious about how you so, – so that's why I tell patients, right, for example, I may say, gosh, your surgery was pretty straightforward. I really think I got it all out. It was a pretty clear-cut case. You know, small chance you may have it on your ovaries or uh, on your uterus in the future. Or a patient, I may say, well, gosh, you had like six different endometriosis. I took out your ovaries. Gosh, I, uh, I, I visualized this the best I could. I wanted to save your ovaries, so I, you know, I didn't take both your ovaries out. But, you know, there's a, you may have a chance to have a, a new cyst form in the future. Or I may tell a patient, gosh, I feel like I got all of your endometriosis out, but I found a big nodule in your rectum that you're going to, you know, if we want to get that out, we'll have to go back with a colorectal surgeon, for example, and do a bowel resection. So that's kind of the tone of my, my discussion with patients afterwards. Mm -hmm. Well, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about PCOS uh, and just what the implications are. Because for PCOS, it wouldn't occur to me that that would be a line of treatment to do surgery on the ovary. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. So polycystic ovarian syndrome, many patients with this syndrome, they don't cycle normally and they don't have their periods every month and they might have only a couple periods a year. So their deficient or defective, if I may say, ovulations can be a, a, um, a, a cause of their infertility. So way back in the 1930s, uh, two doctors named Stein and Leventhal um, described ovarian wedge resection surgery for polycystic ovarian syndrome patients. And I believe they had some experimental animal data that they kind of went off to develop this procedure. And they noted, obviously, these ovaries are enlarged. And so if, if you, in their minds, if you took a, a segment, if, if you removed part of the ovary and sewed it back together, they found that about 90% of women uh, had normal menstrual cycles. And pregnancy rates were also 80, 90% in these women, whereas beforehand they had been infertile. So at, a, at the time, it was a landmark uh, discovery. Now, since that time, in the 1960s, they developed medications like Clomid, and those are medications that basically the first ovulation induction where you can give those to a woman, and they can help those patients uh, ovulate without surgery. So Clomid was then widely used, and then certainly then in the 1980s, then uh, you know IVF came around. And so ovarian wedge resection, I feel, not given the attention it deserves, uh, I feel that it should be offered to many more patients than it is. It's true that, so my own approach, uh, to put concisely, is like this. So if a patient has polycystic ovaries and she's not ovulating normally, 
I will use ovulation medications first because it's relatively, many times it's relatively cheap. You do not have surgical risks. And many patients can get pregnant and do nicely on them. So fine, if we try this medication, get pregnant, great. But if you try it and eat, if they're not ovulating, if you can't get them to ovulate on this, or they're not getting pregnant, then I feel the wedge resection surgery is a consideration. And those groups of patients, so polycystic uh, ovarian syndrome patients who are either not ovulating or not pregnant after six cycles of ovulation induction, when I do a wedge resection surgery on them, my pregnancy rate is about 50%. So 50% of those patients that, that you know, they were getting pregnant, okay, now they can. It's not 100%. I wish it was, but not 100%. The other alternative is you can use a little bit stronger medications rather than Clomid. You could use injectable medications like Minipur or Folosim or Brevel. Those are some of the same medications that IVF doctors use for the IVF process. Now, when they do the IVF process, they're trying to make a patient produce 30 eggs or 20 eggs to harvest all these eggs and so forth. And, and so I, I, my goal when I use those medications is just to get one follicle or, or maybe two uh, to help to try to restore a normal ovulatory process uh, for ovulation. PCOS patients have an increased risk of twins and triplets and so forth, multiple pregnancies, and also ovarian hyperstimulation where you might form tons of follicles and, and that might cause pain and a risk of the ovaries rupturing and, a, and, and other things to the body fluid balance like dehydration where it can be a real problem for women. So that's why ovarian red resection can avoid those risks. I don't know if I've ever had a set of twins after ovarian red resection. The ones that I know of all of them have been singleton pregnancies. And many times these women can get pregnant without medication at all. And um, some might need a small dose of Clomid, for example. But uh, I have patients that have failed IVF with PCOS, get pregnant after wedge. I have one patient, she tried for eight years with Clomid and some other medications with other physicians. Then I did the wedge, and she's had now three full-term pregnancies without any medications at all. So it can be a really useful procedure. Well, that's really interesting. Something to think about. I mean, at first glance, it sounds really invasive to do a surgery on your ovary, but... Uh, if it has the potential to kind of solve some sort of physical issue there. And then in the healing process, normal ovulation resumes and pregnancy happens spontaneously. Uh, I think that that sounds like a good option (laughs) if if it's appropriate. Um, So, you know, as we're coming to a close, the one other topic that I thought I would ask you about is Ovulatory disorders. I know that um, I've had some of my clients that I teach fertility awareness to ask me about luteinized, luteinizing or luteinized unruptured follicle or a variety of different uh, issues that can happen with the ovary. And I'd just love to hear your take on that or if, if that's something that you see a lot. Sure. Yeah, that's a, a great question. That's a very frustrating um, disorder. For the listeners, that concept is, you know, someone might have normal menstrual cycles. They get their cycles every month. That does not mean, however, that they're ovulating normally. For example, maybe their follicle, their egg cell grows, but maybe it does not rupture. And if it doesn't rupture, the egg cell cannot escape the ovary uh, and it can't travel down the tube uh, to meet the sperm and have a conception. Now, that problem could happen and a woman could still have uh, monthly cycles and so she would not know it otherwise. So it's a frustrating problem. You, you must do serial ultrasounds to find it. And so that's why for all our fertility patients, we get one cycle where we we track their ovulations uh, to make sure they're rupturing. One other comment, I'll make a couple other comments. One is that for most other doctors, just a normal fertility doctor who does not use NAPA technology, for example, when they do inseminations, they'll do ultrasounds, they'll give stimulation, for example, they'll do ultrasounds until the, the follicle is a mature size. Then after that, they do a trigger shot, but they don't do, and, and they do the insemination, but no other ultrasounds. So I don't know why they don't, why, you know, uh, because still, if you're doing insemination, the egg still has to get out. So in our patients, we find that about 10% of fertility patients have this problem. So it's not rare. Uh, I, I feel that along with the wedge resection, it's one of those things I feel like is underappreciated. It can be frustrating to treat. Uh, I'll say that Jerome Check is, a, uh, is actually a fertility doctor here in New Jersey that has done a lot of studies on, on this problem. And he has shown that you can, ovarian stimulation can help. So you can use different combinations of either Clomid or maybe injectable stimulation with different varieties of trigger shots like HCG or even Lupron sometimes. Again, a light dose. Now, I know I talked about Lupron before as a pelvic pain thing, but these are very small doses. And certainly we would not use it if we didn't have to, but it can help to trigger ovulation. One other association I have is luteinized unnutrient follicles can be more common in patients with endometriosis, particularly and also with significant endometriosis sometimes. So sometimes that association is something 
noteworthy. And so some patients may need surgery for endometriosis, but maybe you can certainly have it without having endometriosis. Sometimes it could be just an enzymatic problem of the ovarian tissue or the enzymes in the ovary. Um, and so it can be quite frustrating. Not that the same treatment doesn't work for all patients. You have to kind of maybe go in a stepwise fashion to find something that works for a patient. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that that's really um, important for women to know and really interesting because uh, to know that you could potentially have a regular looking cycle, uh, even if you're charting your cycle, it can look relatively normal. But sure. still, if you're having this type of ovulatory disorder, you don't know that the egg isn't rupturing. So, right. um, yeah. you know, Dr. Bider, I just want to thank you so much for going in depth into all of these topics. I've really had a ball picking your brain. It's been sure. a <laughs> <laughs> a lot of fun. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, after everything we've talked about today, what is the one thing that you want the listeners to take away from our conversation? Yeah. Gosh, I guess the one thing I'd say is, is maybe like I mentioned before that, you know, well, one that, that, you know, NAPR technology, that this kind of scientist, you know, this science exists and it's not just, I mean, NAPR technology physicians and, and doctors do know this. And it's not like we're the only ones that, that practice like that. There are other doctors that kind of know these principles and use them too. So it's not us alone, but you know, that, 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 gosh, that there are, are good, healthy alternatives for you out there rather than just IVF or insemination. There are other, uh, you know, alternatives for you. And, and also the second thing is just to, you know, the, the human body is very wonderful. I mean, it's, um, you know, my, my philosophy and the philosophy of NAPA technology is to, to try to help the body, you know, to, to, uh, to optimize the body's own natural function and to give you the best chances. And many patients have great success that way. And we've helped patients that have failed IVF, as I mentioned maybe before, and but don't give up hope. I know it can be a long journey, especially the, the, you know, the infertility journey can be a long journey. So I'd say don't give up hope. Just hang in there and you have a good, many patients have a good shot at, at having a pregnancy. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much. And for the listeners then who want to find out more about you or potentially live in your area, I didn't mention where you uh, work sure, and yeah. live. So maybe you could share where you work and how sure. patient, uh, listeners can get in touch with you. So I am in central New Jersey at St. Peter's University Medical Center. It's in New Brunswick, New Jersey, which is kind of between Princeton and, and New York, about an hour from New York City. My clinic is called the Gianna Center. And the Gianna Center is a network of centers that provide NAPA technology to patients. The goal is to have a, a nationwide network of Gianna Centers. So, and it's, that, that process is slowly being realized. But if you just type in Gianna Center, New Jersey, uh, you'll find our, our clinic, and you'll find a, you know, a number of other clinics like like us. So please, uh, you know, go ahead and take a look if you like, and give us a call if we can help you. Be very happy to help uh, any patients out there that are interested. Okay. Well, thank you again. It was my pleasure to have you. Yeah. Same. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode at fertilityfriday.com/slash/136. I hope that you enjoyed today's interview with Dr. Biter. It was such a pleasure to be able to chat with him and to get more into the technical side of things and the surgical perspective and really get the perspective from a skilled surgeon in this area and what his perspective is on surgery, when it might be indicated for, what it does, why it could be beneficial, how it could improve fertility and also just what distinguishes the surgical practice of MAPRO technology versus typical or other surgical practices that aren't as specialized in this area. And so I found so much of what we talked about to be fascinating um, and an interesting perspective, you know, about endometriosis. So interesting that there's a potential for surgery in the treatment of PCOS and how that can improve ovulatory function just by doing a surgery. I I thought that that was really interesting possibility and really interesting research that has come about and also interesting results and exciting results that he's had with his patients uh, that he's treated with PCOS and also fibroids. I think it's really interesting to think about all of those things and when you may consider surgery for treating something like that. One of the things that I love about the work that I do and just the number of different interviews that I've had the privilege of doing really with a number of health professionals in different fields is you really get a sense of the fact that there's different ways to go about addressing some of the same problems. So where some practitioners really work towards dietary changes, lifestyle changes to see improvements in certain areas. Other practitioners, when he was talking about adhesions and the location of the ovaries in relation to the fallopian tubes and how sometimes these parts of our body that are not supposed to be attached 
will attach themselves for various reasons, especially if there's endometriosis or if you've had a prior surgery. What I think is really interesting is that as he's talking about those things, I couldn't help but think about the RVO therapy and the implications of, of having that abdominal therapy. I've had a number of guests on the show that talked about how actually going in and doing therapy on the abdomen can make a difference in terms of impacting the adhesive qualities of your internal organs, as well as improved circulation, all those different types of things. So I would encourage you to go back and listen to the episode that I recorded with Dr. Arvigo is number 18. And I would also encourage you to look at the episode that I recorded with Rachel Eyre. That's number 67. And I'll link a few other episodes, the episode that I recorded with Marie Whitman, uh, as well as the episode that I recorded with Claire Blake. Because in those episodes, there was a, a theme of abdominal therapy to really do the physical manipulation from the outside <laughs> to improve circulation and to potentially have an effect on some of the adhesions that could be there. And so it's really fascinating to hear the different perspectives and also really encouraging to see all of the different options that we have available to us in this amazing time <laughs> that we find ourselves living. And also important to note the, the different types of surgical practices and surgical techniques that can be used. I, I know some of the uh, information that Dr. Bider spoke about was really complex. And I think that that really uh, shed some light just on the incredible specialization that takes place if someone's going to undergo this line of work uh, with fertility in particular. So I really hope that you enjoyed the episode. And like I mentioned, on the show notes page, we'll have some pictures for you so you actually can see a visual representation of what endometriosis actually looks like in the body, which was really fascinating. And I just want to thank Dr. Bider for taking a moment to share that with me. When you think about these illnesses such as fibroids and endometriosis, from my perspective as someone who's not a doctor that has not, you know, and will not ever <laughs> see a live fibroid because I'm not in a, a surgery room. I think it's really interesting and helpful in some ways to actually see what it looks like because it helps us just to connect a little bit more to what's happening in our bodies and to have a, a more deeper understanding of what's really going on. If this is your first time listening to the show or if you've been listening for a while, I'd like to invite you to join us in the Fertility Friday community in our Facebook group and continue the conversation over there. You can head over to fertilityfriday.com slash community to be redirected to the group. And I just want to thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I appreciate all of you for taking the time to listen to the show. And thank you all for supporting the show and letting me be part of your day, whether you're commuting to work or on the go, going for a run, whatever it is. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And as always, until next time, be well and happy charting. Happy charting.